I'll just start off with, obviously we had the reading of Genesis chapter 1 that Tim has just read for us. Okay. And I want to start by saying that I believe in creation. As a Christadelphian, as a Bible believer, I believe that Genesis 1 is an account of what God did to create the earth and everything that is in it. But this is not the general consensus of the whole world. Um, so here is a, a um, questionnaire that were given to some people in, in different countries and they were asked what they thought and how the origin and the development of human started on earth. Um, so in Canada, 61% believed that they evolved, 24% created with, within 10,000 years and 15% were not sure. America, nearly half believed that humans were created within 10,000 years. But for Great Britain, it was quite different. So 68% of people in Great Britain believe that humans evolved over millions of years and just 16% created within 10,000 and 15% not sure. And, and we, you've seen within the school system and just within the general population that evolution is just taught as fact nowadays even though it cannot be proven and and that's sort of the reason why i prepared this talk and gave people an opportunity to to listen to it because of the general belief in the population i believe insects is a particularly good example of a intelligent designer when we see the different types of insects that around the world so before we go into our particular subject tonight, um, I just want to think about the idea of evolution and adaptation. Now I'm no, by no means a biologist or have any real expertise in this uh, particular subject, but there are the main differences between adaptation and evolution, and you'll be able to read through them on the screen. Um, and there's a word that you might not be very aware of, where it says um, phenotypic and genotypic um, and just to explain those words to you so phenotypic is the outward appearance of the genes of a, an animal or, or a plant whereas the genotypic is the genes within the animal the genetics that make up the animal and then the phenotypic is the outward appearance so here is an example of um, adaptation so on the picture on the left we've got a population of mice of both brown or tan and black and they move to a place where the ro rocks are very dark and because of that the tan mice are more visible and so they get eaten by the birds more regularly and so over years and over generations there are more black mice because the tan mice were more noticeable on the the black rocks so that's nothing to do with evolution that's just the environmental impacts that are on the mice in this particular area and I think this example helped for me um, so here are some coca-cola bottles um, and it shows in a way the evolution of the coca-cola bottle all the way back 100 200 years ago but but the substance of the bottle is still the same it is a glass bottle that is designed to hold coke whereas a coca-cola can is completely different it's changed its shape completely, it's changed what it is. The genetics of it has changed from glass to metal. And I believe that is what evolution is trying to make us believe, that things that animals and insects are capable of completely changing their makeup. Um, so there's just one example um, that I find useful in terms of adaptation and evolution. So we just read Genesis 1, didn't we? And if you can just open your Bibles there, if you close them. So what do we find out in Genesis chapter 1? We read the whole chapter, and not just where it talks about animals, because it's important that we understand what God did when he created all of the earth. So we found out that God created everything. He created heaven and earth in verse 1. In verse 5, he created day and night. In verse 8, he created the heavens. In verse 10 and 11, dry ground and plants. Verse 16, he created the sun and the moon. Verse 21, he created the fish and birds. And then verse 24, every living thing. And that's described over the last 
six or so verses there. And we keep on getting this phrase, don't we, as we go through. Um, in verse 21, as an example, God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And we get the same phrase in verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and, at w and it was so. So this allows for adaptation, small changes within the populations of these animals. But how does God describe it at the end? And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it, would, it was very good. So he created land, sea, plants, animals, and insects within seven days. He did not create organisms that then evolved into the animals and the humans that we see around us. So why did we pick, or why did I pick, insects as the subject to show us that we have an intelligent designer? So first of all, it's a subject I'm particularly interested in. I've got two boys and we've recently caught some caterpillars and we've got them in a butterfly house and we're hoping to see them turn into a chrysalis and a butterfly. It's not going too well so far, but hopefully things will improve for them. Um, so here is a list of the different animals, birds and, and so on, and how many different um, species there are of each animal. So mammals, there are 4,381 different species of mammals in the world. And you've got birds, reptiles and so on. And spiders as well. And we'll be thinking about spiders a bit this evening. Um, obviously they're found all over the world. Um, very different sizes and types. But would anyone like to have a guess at how many different species of insects are believed to be on the planet that have been, uh, that have been discovered so far? Obviously, there could be many more. Million. Million. Oh, good guess. Good guess. Any other guesses? Yeah? Way more than a million. Way more than a million. <laughs> That's the, uh, well, a million is a very good guess, actually. Uh, 915,000 different species of insects. So, so much more than all the other animals um, and, and jellyfish and all the different types that we've got there. So over 900,000 different species of insects. So that's 80% of all the world's species are insects. So it's a great example of proving design when we see all the different types and, and what they are capable of. And again, that's all that have been discovered. I'm sure there are many tens of thousands more that have not yet been discovered. And so evolution would make us believe that these 915 different insects all started as one thing and then changed over time. And, and this is what they would suggest. Um, so this is one pictorial representation of it. Um, across the bottom we've got millions of years. So 450 million of years ago there was one insect. And over time, uh, evolution, these, they started mutating, changing, evolving to the 915,000 that we've got now. Uh, and I would suggest that because of the differences that we see in them, that this could not be the case. And, and as we've read, God created all and it was very good. So, if it all evolved from one organism at the start, that would mean that something as small as a firefly, fairy fly, sorry, uh, which is 0.15 millimetres long, came from the same insect as the giant wetter, and that's real, if, in case you're wondering, uh, which is 10 centimetres long. That means that the roundness of the ladybird came from the same insect as the lankiness of a stick insect. And that also means that the bombardier beetle that is able to fire hot acid came from the same insect as a firefly that is able to light up. And, and there's just six examples of, of the var varies that we have within the species of insects and how different they are. And I'm hoping to show over the next couple of slides how well designed insects are for the environment they were, uh, that they are born into. So we're going to play a little game, Can You Find the Insect? 
Um, so again, this is me trying to prove that these insects are perfectly designed for the environment that they are in because of how well they are disguised. So uh, if you see the insect, just give me a small nod. And once everyone's nodding, we'll move on. It could be a while, but hopefully we'll be fine. Um, so here's the first one. So if you think you can see the insect in this picture, give me a small nod. Small nod, couple of nods. Couple people like, where is it? <laughs> um, so what we have on this page is a leaf insect. Um, they're also called walking leaves, and they're found in southeast Asia. Uh, and that's a picture of one with the background. And you can't see my mouse, but um, here's the head, and that's the body. And it's got two arms here. So it's, it's on the branch. Um, and you can see that the way that it's designed and the way that it is created that has the appearance of bite marks on the leaves. It's not perfectly green, it's brown around the edges as if it's fallen off a tree. And to further confuse predators, when it, when it walks, it rocks back and forth and it's meant to mimic a real leaf being blown by the wind. Okay, here's another one. Just a normal leaf on a branch. But again, when you look a bit closer, here we have a common barren caterpillar. And that's what it looks like on, on a wooden branch. And you can see how it's perfectly in the middle of the leaf. And when it's sitting there, it's completely well disguised from any birds or any predators that might be looking from above. Um, this is found in Sri Lanka. And it in fact grows into a, a brown uh, butterfly. Um, but again, perfectly designed to be able to disguise itself. This one's a bit easier. Um, and it's got a very imaginative name, the dead leaf butterfly. Um, but again, if that was on the floor of a, a forest with all the dead leaves, again, very well hidden. And, and there it is on, on a green leaf to show the difference. And again, it's got veins, it's got dark patches, it's not completely uniform. Um, again, that's disguised well. Here's another one. So you might recognize the flowers, quite common in, in people's houses. It's an orchid, or some different orchid flowers. But on the top, we have something called an orchid mantis, which is found in, in Malaysia and Thailand. Um, and you can see it, the head's up at the top, and the body comes down. You can see the colors um, are matched the plant perfectly. Um, and it climbs up the plant, up to the top of the flowers, and it holds on. And again, it sways around with the wind, and it waits for flies to land on the petals, and then um, has them, uh, eats them. Um, again, perfectly designed, uh, and that's what it looks like when it's on a green leaf. You can see, again, the colors are, are perfect to be able to blend in to the orchid flower. Now, the next one is easy to spot. So, yeah, well done, you found it. So, this is called a giant swallowtail caterpillar. Um, I won't put the picture up of what it's meant to look like because it's meant to look like bird droppings. Um, and you can see the colors and the likeness of it is exactly the same, but I won't put a picture up of it. But again, a predator flying over this particular leaf would not be um, wanting to, to fly down and, and eat this particular caterpillar. Uh, so we'll do a couple more. Um, so here we've got two branches, uh, both with thorns on. But if you look a bit closer on, on the one on the left, we have a branch with no thorns on, but with something called a thorn bug. And again, it's got red tips on all of the insects on the left, the thorn bug. And so when predators, again, are trying to land somewhere, they're not going to want to land on the branch on the left because it believes to be a thorny branch. Um, and the bright green, the bright red, it wards predators off from, from landing on that particular branch. And the, the last one's my favorite. Um, so it's called an orange tip caterpillar. Um, and you can see that one, that's good. Um, so here it's on a branch, not particularly good at hiding itself. But when it is aggravated, when it um, can sense 
um, a predator close, it can make a remarkable transformation. And it's not evolution or adaptation or anything like that. It's, it's the way it, and what it does with its body. So I've got a video here of, of what the orange tip caterpillar does when it is threatened. So, just to explain, at the moment it's upside down, so its legs are hang, hanging onto the branch, um, and this is its face here, so its legs are at the bottom, so it's upside down at the moment. Now, what does it start to look like now? A snake, okay? And it's almost like the sunlight's coming through the leaves and it's got some white top bits at the top of its eyes. And if a predator's looking to eat that caterpillar and it turns into that, uh, it would go away quite quickly. So that's the common barren caterpillar that is able to look um, like a snake when it feels threatened. And it's not like it evolved over millions of years and tried to put the eyes here and the eyes there. It's perfectly designed by God to be able to make itself look like a snake to any predators that might want to, might want to eat it. So there's some examples of how insects can blend into the environment that they are, that they are in to show the, the design by God, the intelligent design that all these incredible insects are able to camouflage themselves. So... Now let's spend some time thinking about insects that we find in the Bible. Can anyone shout out any insects that we find in the Bible? I've got three. There might be more. But three. Spider. Will. Spider. Yeah. Locust. Um, and ants. But that's the three that we'll be looking at. Well done, everybody. <laughs> so we'll start by looking at the, the locust. So where do we read of locusts in the Bible? Any uh, youngsters? Okay. Have a thing. Go on, then, Luke. John the Baptist, when he was in the wilderness, he ate locusts. Okay, good. Any live locusts anywhere? Egypt. Egypt, yeah. If you could turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 10. So Exodus chapter 10, we have the children of Israel in the land of Egypt as slaves, and God has called Moses to bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and take them to the land of Israel. So Exodus chapter 10, we're going to read verse 4 to 6. And Moses um, said to Pharaoh, If thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. They shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. And they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all thy Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. So these locusts that were going to come, they were going to cover the face of the earth and they were going to eat everything that the hail had not um, destroyed. They were going to cover it and nothing like their fathers or their father's fathers had ever seen. And just another verse that we have in, in Proverbs, uh, written by Solomon, who we believe had great wisdom and was able to know lots about animals. Um, this is what he wrote. The locusts have no king yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. So they all go together. There's no particular leader, but they all move together. So this is what we read of them in the Bible. Is this the case? What have scientists managed to work out from locusts now? So I'm going to put a video up now. Um, it is narrated by David Atterborough. I haven't got him with me to give us some information, but hopefully this will work.
There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers, for at this stage they're flightless. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. But when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the fast track. As the vegetation you start to imagine how it had been for the Egyptians. Out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. locust eats its entire body weight every day and a whole swarm can consume literally hundreds of tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The swarm travels with the wind. It's the most energy-saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stop it there. Um, but we can see the amount that they were eating then. Um, and a desert, locust, uh, a desert locust swarm can be 460 square miles in size and have 40 to 80 million locusts in less than half a square mile. So if you think about those numbers um, and, and he said that each locust can eat its weight in plants each day so a swarm of 40 to 80 million locusts in half a mile this 460 square miles can eat 423 million pounds of plants every day and you can imagine that for the Egyptians and, and it said in Proverbs didn't it that the locusts have no king yet they go forth all of them by bands um, and he talked there about the fact that they go away from low pressure, that, that they go with the wind and they release pheromones to say, now it's time for us to go and find somewhere new to go. And, and that's what it said in Proverbs, but scientists have been able to work that out now, how they're able to go in one direction all at the same time. And incredible um, that we read of these things and we can see it now. Um, not so much in this country, but in, in other places in the world, this can be a real problem for crops and, and, and things like that. So that's the, the locust. If we could turn, please, to Proverbs chapter 6, where we can consider the ant and what the ant is noted for in Scripture. So Proverbs chapter 6. Reading from verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. And just on the screen as well, Proverbs chapter 30. There be four things that are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet prepare their meat in the summer. So we have the idea that ants, they have no ruler, but they all, again, go in the same direction. They provide food.
for billions of ants um, and gather the food in the harvest and they're strong. They're not strong but they still can get their food. Now I haven't got a video um, for this one but there is an example of ants working together to get food um, and there is a particular ant called the long horn crazy ant which is able, able to form formations and work together as a group. Um, they can pull heavy food items such as Cheerios and again not very big for us but for an ant that's a fairly big sized meal and they all go in the same direction, they move it in the same direction there are leaders that guide the group and scientists have looked at this and able to see how, how they work as a team and again we read these things in, in the Bible from, from Solomon from what he knew but now we can see how scientists can really break it down and understand how they can work together as a team and then the last one we'll be looking at is um, spiders. So if we could turn please to Isaiah chapter 59, which is where we get spiders um, described. And it highlights a particular element of what spiders are able to do. And what I'm sure we all are aware that spiders can do and what they are well known for. So Isaiah chapter 59 Verse, starting at verse 4. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. So we've got the, um, the prophet Isaiah talking about people um, who are trying to do mischief and iniquity they hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web that is what spiders are well known for aren't they their, their web and this is a this is a web of a Darwin bark spider um, and you can see the length of the web there and again we're going to watch a short video about the Darwin bark spider and, and about its web and how incredible um, this particular web is. Like a real life spider woman, she sprays strands of silk in one long continuous flow. The threads fan out like a sail and drift on air currents blowing across the water. Every few seconds, she crimps the strands together to stop them spreading too widely. The breeze will do the rest, blowing the threads into a single line and a 25-meter bridge. Now she must reinforce her bridge because her web will hang from it. But there's something bouncing the line at the other end. Another Darwin spider is trying to take advantage of her hard work. She must deal with the intruder head on. The cut line is an inconvenience, but no more than that. With hooks on the tips of each leg, she gathers in the thread. It won't go to waste, as she'll eat it later. Okay, so there's the, <clears throat> the Darwin bark spider. He was able to do a 25 meter long web over a river to be able to get across it. Um, and you can see, again how he talked about the, the simple things so the spider needs to know that the wind is going in a particular direction before she starts that she like I said, crimps it together to make sure it stays together and then has to reinforce it um, and even if it does get broken she can just eat 20 meters of web and just reuse it um, to be able to do it straight again and uh, the video carries on she just does it straight again uh, straight after she just does the same web to get across the river um, and again scientists have looked at this web um, and they've found out that it can absorb absorb 
massive kinetic energy before breaking and they say it's 10 times better than Kevlar armor and, and that's used to make body armor. So again, we see this incredible design of this tiny, tiny spider that is able to hold within itself 25 meters of web to be able to get across a river. Um, and before um, we, we bring it to close, just some incredible pictures of other insects and, and we've looked at the way that they can hide themselves, we looked at the things that they can do, but the colours and, and again the design of them are absolutely incredible. So just some different pictures of different insects now. The colours and, and the shapes. At least that one's looking at the camera. That was, uh, that's good. And, and these are in, all in the wonderful creation that we can see around. We can look at these insects and, and, and think about how God created all of these insects to help us believe in him. This last one, <laughs> I quite like this one. Um, this um, was recently discovered in the last five or so years. Um, but it's named after a toy from the 90s, or 80s, maybe 90s. Any ideas what toy that was named after? Not Smurf, but good, good, good guess. They were little, little dolls, and they all had spiky hair. Oh. Trolls, yes. So, of course, this is called the, the troll haired bug. Um, and scientists weren't able to get pictures of it because it moved so quickly, um, but they finally did, and, and this is what the, the image is. And again, just so varied, the insects that we can see around us, and ones that have been discovered every year, and this one in particular has this incredible plumage of hair, and again, the colours are incredible. So this is the, the troll haired bug. So we thought about all these and we thought about insects and, and animals in general. And all animals now are driven by instinct, driven by getting to their next meal. That is what their main drive is. But we as Christadelphians believe that Christ will return and set up his kingdom. And at that time, things will change. If you could turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 11, please. where we read our final um, reference. <clears throat> so there's a lot to break down in these verses. We're going to read the first nine verses, but we're going to think about how it relates to animals and also how it relates to us. So Isaiah chapter 11. And there came forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with the righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ as a judge. Um, so different to the judges and the leaders of, that we see in the world around us. Christ will judge the poor. He will prove the equity. He will do it with righteousness, with, with wisdom, with understanding, with counsel and might. All these things coming together to make the righteous judge. Verse 5. And righteousness shall be in the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And here we have animals discussed. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. And, and when we read back in Genesis, 
it explained in Genesis that the plants would be meat for all of the animals. All the animals in, in creation, we believe, were vegetarian. Um, and it's going to be the same in the kingdom to come. It's going to be returned to what it was like in the Garden of Eden, where animals will eat plants and not each other. That they won't be driven by instinct. Um, they won't be driven by wanting to kill each other. They will be led by a little child, a wolf, a lamb, a kid, a young lion, all being led by a little child. And so I hope this evening you, you found it uh, um, interesting and, and useful because it can reinforce the fact that God did create the heavens and the earth. And God did so much more than that. God has promised Bible believers so much more than that in the, in, in the Bible, of the kingdom to come, a time where there will be a righteous judge. And so if these things have caught your interest and you want to know more about them, please go on and read more of the Bible and understand and know the promises that we can be a part of if we are willing to accept God and Jesus into our lives. Thank you for your attention.